Yuma, good afternoon everyone uh, and welcome to the National Library of Australia. I'm Luke Hickey, I'm the Assistant Director General of the Engagement Branch. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging Australia's First Nation peoples as the traditional owners and custodians of this land. Uh, give my respects to Elders past and present and through them to all Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, thank you for attending this event. Uh, coming to you uh, live from Ngunnawal and Ngambri country for those of you who are watching online. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to welcome live audiences back into the library after quite a long hiatus uh, and it's really terrific to have people here, uh, a live audience as well as those watching online. Uh, this afternoon's presentation is by adjunct professor uh, Russell McGregor. Uh, 2021 National Library of Australia Fellow, whose fellowship is funded in memory of Avril Edwards, a former library staff member. With last year's COVID lockdowns, the completion of Russell's fellowship was delayed slightly, but we're very pleased that he's been able to complete the research for this year for his project, Bird Lovers, A History of Birdwatching Passions. Russell is an adjunct professor at, of history at James Cook University and the author of several award-winning books. His latest, Idling in Green Places, A Life of Alec Chisholm, was shortlisted for the 2020 National Biography Award. And as befits his fellowship project, uh, Russell is a passionate bird watcher. Uh, Russell's research at the National Library has focused on compiling a history of bird watching in Australia from the late 19th century through to the present day and drawing on a wide diversity of sources from the library's collection. This presentation will not only highlight the changes in birdwatching practice over the years, but also look at the rise of an environmental ethos and ways in which settler Australians have embraced nature to cultivate a sense of national belonging. Please join me in welcoming Russell McGregor. Thanks, Luke, and thank you all for coming. Birds express all that is beautiful, joyous, and free in nature. That's the opening sentence of Neville Cayley's What Bird Is That? published in 1931. They delight our eyes, charm our ears, quicken our imagination, and through association with the bushland, inspire us with a profound love of country. Even the non-birders among you, that's probably most of you, will have heard of Cayley's book. It's now an Australian classic and has been reissued in so many revised editions and renovated formats that it's hard to keep count. What Bird Is That? is a field guide, a book to help you match a flighty, feathery creature with a name. Compared to the field guides available to us today, Cayley's isn't very good. The plates are crowded, the picture's tiny, the description's exasperatingly terse, and the physical book ill-suited to roughing it in the field. But at the same time, it's a wonderful book, well-deserving its now classic status, because it's not merely an instrument facilitating the matching of a bird with a name. Beyond that, Cayley gives voice to the passions of birdwatching. His introduction continues from where I left off. What visions of freedom and joy come to us when we see a flock of scarlet honey eaters feeding among the blossoms of a tea tree, a spinebill sipping nectar from a, nat from a native fuchsia, a blue wren moving among the golden beauty of a wattle tree, or silver gulls flying lazily above the limpid blue waters of our harbours. What pleasure is ours when we hear the joyful, carefree caroling of magpies at dawn, the springtime song of the grey thrush, the wonderful song mimicry of the lyre tail, or a song lark soaring heavenwards, filling the air with its melody. Cayley's words encapsulate the emotive and aesthetic aspects of birding which have endured through to the present day. As a birder myself, Luke's already told you that I am, but I suppose it's obvious that anyone doing this research project would have to be. But as a birder, it's the emotional and aesthetic aspects that most sustain my interest. Among birders, and many other people for that matter, there's a notion that birds are magical creatures. Their ability seeming, 
seemingly to defy gravity, floating and flouncing on thin air. Their gorgeous plumage and glorious songs, their behaviour that veers sometimes sharply between cute and confronting, their possession of characters so like and yet so unlike our own. These make birds into enchanting creatures. People have long found, uh, people have long found them so. Bird watchers merely go a few steps further and actively seek to be enchanted. There's also a scientific side to bird watching, and Neville Cayley promoted that too. Like other birders of his day, he urged people to make precise observations, write them down promptly, collate them and contribute, and contribute their findings to ornithological associations and publications. Today, we call it citizen science, with birders submitting their observations to global scientific repositories such as eBird uh, via apps on their phones. The title and the technology are new, but recreational birders contributing to ornithological science continues a long tradition. There are other Historically interesting aspects of birding, its strong and enduring conservationist stance, for example. In the history that of uh, bird watching that I'm writing, these other aspects, its scientific side, its conservationist and social dimensions will receive due attention. But my fellowship here at the National Library took the title Bird Lovers a history of bird watching passions. So in this talk, I'll keep some focus on the emotional and aesthetic aspects of birding, but don't expect the, the focus to be tight. As my, title suggests, uh, as my title suggests, many of the relevant emotions are positive, loving birds, cherishing them, adoring, admiring, and appreciating birds as in the passages I've quoted from Cayley's field guide. But the emotions of birding, like those of all human activities, are not all positive. Some birders feel revulsion against, even despise certain birds, often introduced species like sparrows and starlings, sometimes aggressive natives like noisy and bell miners. Like the latter named species, Birders can be competitive, combative, and quarrelsome. It doesn't take long acquaintance with the history of bird watching um, bodies to realize that they're riven with faction and discord, usually over issues utterly incomprehensible to outsiders. Even loving birds has not always aligned smoothly with birders' other passions, such as their dedicated such as their dedication to studying birds, especially when, as was once the case, studying them entailed shooting them and robbing their nests. The tensions between the myriad passions of the, um, the tensions between the myriad passions of birding deserve and get due attention in what I'm writing, as do the emotional entanglements of birding with other enterprises and ambitions. Bird watching, I believe, is fundamentally driven by passion, emotion. In that regard, we can see birding as a manifestation of modern urban people's craving for communion with nature. Of course, that's not, of course, that's not birding's only motivation. Beyond it lie a whole muddle of motives, from a thirst for knowledge to a love of lists, from the twitch's competitive com uh, compulsion to store the, score the biggest tally of um, sightings to the aesthete's appreciation of avian melodies in a dewy dawn. Yet connecting with nature is and always has been a powerful impetus behind birding. My research is historical. I'm an historian by profession. Well, I was until I retired some years ago. But somehow, as before, 
I still seem to spend my time hanging around libraries and archives, searching out stuff about the past. As an historian, I trace changes as well as continuities in the practices of birding over time. The passions of birding have certainly changed, as have birders' modes of expressing and communicating them. But there's also been a high level of continuity, as demonstrated by the quoted passages from Cayley, now over 90 years old. His wording is not quite how we might frame such things today, but it's close, and his evident feeling for birds even closer. The period I'm surveying is from around the turn of the 20th century to now. There's no definitive date for the beginning of bird watching, but a pastime and practice recognizably similar to birding today emerged around the end of the 19th century. It wasn't then quite the same as it is now. I've already mentioned that collecting, that is, killing birds and robbing their nests, was once prominent practice amongst birders. The decline of those practices and the drivers of that decline are among the topics I'm examining. Nevertheless, there's sufficient commonality between birding today and birding around the turn of the 20th century and sufficient difference to what went before to date the beginnings of modern birding to around that time. And that's the consensus too among historians of bird watching in the USA and the UK where that topic has attracted a lot more attention than it has here. For an end date, as for many things, there's no better time than the present. Originally, I planned to take my research only up to the 1960s. That's sensible in some ways, because there were some significant changes after that time, and a more circumscribed time period can help avoid the, prob the common problem of historical research lurching off into infinity. But there's too much juicy stuff after the 1960s. To take just one example, it was only after then, probably in the late 70s, early 80s, that the practice now known as twitching took off in Australia. With its obsessive compulsion to see rare and out of place birds, to score an ever increasing list and its marvelously inventive repertoire of lists, lists of birds seen, seen in Australia, seen in the world, in my garden, in my neighborhood, my state, my region and so forth, even birds seen on TV. Twitching is too wonderfully fertile a topic to avoid in a history of bird watching passions. Most of my research is with written documents of one kind or another from here in the National Library and elsewhere. I also talk with birders and those talks will have a significant uh, contribution to my writings on the topic. But most of my time is spent with my nose in a book or journal or newspaper or letter or diary or some other papery preserver of words. I guess that's the stereotypical image of an historian and I'm old enough to reinforce the stereotype without inhibitions. Here in the National Library, the array of documentary sources is superb, verging on overwhelming. Actually, it is overwhelming at times, but that's a boon. Thanks again to the library for facilitating my access to those documents via the fellowship and to the library staff for ensuring that everything ran smoothly. I won't subject you to a comprehensive rundown of the documents I've examined, but I'd like to take you on a ramble through some of them and the people who created them focusing on the first 50 years or so of bird watching in Australia. It's a ramble, not a dissertation, but a ramble can be more interesting than a power walk and maybe we can learn more from it. I hope it reveals not only some of what my fellowship here has entailed, but also something about what makes bird watchers tick. Although the birders among you will know that Within the pastime, tick 
has another meaning. Let me begin then with this guy in the front centre of the uh, main photo. He was one of Australia's earliest birders, Archibald James Campbell, born 1853, died 1929. His papers are here in the National Library. Among his many birding achievements is that he took the first photograph of an Australian bird species in the wild. Crested terns photographed on direction islet off Rottnest Island, Western Australia on 21st November, 1889. That puts it among the earliest photographs taken of wild birds anywhere in the world. A pioneer photographer, Campbell was also a keen collector of eggs and bird skins. In time, photographing birds would supersede collecting them, except for closely circumscribed scientific purposes. The camera, along with binoculars and field guides, would, by sometime 1930s, thereabouts, displace the gun from the birder's kit. But for Campbell and fellow, fellow birders in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, photographs were a supplement to the skin and egg collection rather than a replacement for it. They still put primary value on their collections and photographs were mere convenient images of those tangible objects. It would be some decades before possessing the image came to be valued over possessing the object itself. Campbell's writings are suffused with a strong aesthetic appreciation of birds. His major book, Nests and Eggs of Australian Birds, published 1900, is about much more than what the title specifies. Its pages are filled with celebrations of birds in all their glory their appearance, songs, behaviour, habits, beauty and charm. They also recount Campbell's collecting exploits and readers today might find jarring the book's conjunction of delight in bird life and relish in robbing their nests. Among the many photos is this one of the egg collecting enterprise itself, a wonderful shot of a naked man climbing out of a swamp up into a tree to collect a wood duck's nest. The photographer was Campbell. I don't know who the um, climber was. Nonetheless, <clears throat> the photograph captures the flavour of robust masculine adventure, so characteristic of ornithological collecting. Few collectors were women. Another aspect of Campbell's work that might jar with readers today comes at the end of his introduction to nests and eggs. My doxology, he proclaimed, no work should be complete without praise to God and perhaps more especially no natural history work. A devout Presbyterian, he followed the old dictum that the study of natural history revealed the glory of God's handiwork. That belief was being whittled away during Campbell's lifetime under the combined pressures of um, Darwinian evolutionism and the secularisation of society. But a core assumption survived and still survives today, that by engaging us with nature, bird watching can offer spiritual uplift to modern urban people. Campbell was um, one of the most active and prominent founders of the Australasian Ornithologist Union in 1901 and the Bird Lovers Club four years later. As such, he was a crucial figure in putting Australian bird watching on firm institutional foundations. Those bodies survive today, now combined under the name BirdLife Australia. The photograph <coughs> taken in 1921, shows Campbell as an elderly man flanked by two other notable ornithologists of the day. On his right stands an intense Neville Cayley. We've already encountered him as the author of What Bird Is That? On his left is an ebullient 
Sidney Jackson. I'll turn to him now. Sid Jackson was a professional collector of skins and eggs, lived from 1873 to 1946. Indeed, he was one of the most skilled and successful ornithological collectors in Australia in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Among other achievements, he collected the first specimen of a female Rufus scrub bird from the rainforest of the Lamington um, Tablelands in Queensland in 1919. That is, he shot it, skinned it, and preserved the skin with liberal doses of arsenic. But he was also a bird watcher who gained immense pleasure from looking at birds. He loved the birds he saw. That's one of the strongest themes that emerges from the pages of the beautifully handwritten diaries of his collecting expeditions held here in the National Library. He meticulously listed the birds he saw at each, at each location, and the vast majority were never the target of his collector's gun. While travelling by train, coach or car, and his profession necessitated a lot of travel, his favourite recreation was to identify and list the birds he saw, just like birders do today. So Jackson was a man who loved and admired birds, but he also shot them and collected their eggs for a living. The contrariety of his activities embodies some of the multiple themes that thread through the history of bird watching and that I aim to capture in what I'm writing. Birding history, like all history, is filled with both continuities and contraries. Jackson was contrary in other wonderful ways too. He was a portly gentleman, weighing 16 stone or 102 kilos, but an expert and agile tree climber. His contemporaries marvelled at the fact that such a corpulent man, corpulent was the polite term in those days, um, could scale tall trees with apparent ease. He and his brother Frank would um, climb trees up to 30 metres and more in search of nests and eggs and in search of photographs. For Jackson, like Campbell, was a pioneer bird photographer. Tree climbing was then an essential part of bird photography and the extent to which birders risked life and limb climbing to dizzying heights is amazing. His photographs show not only birds and the hazards of collecting them, but also the difficulties and inconveniences of the photographic enterprise at the time, as in this one of his makeshift uh, campsite darkroom in Western New South Wales in 1911. Jackson acknowledged that he was tutored in tree climbing by Aboriginal people, and he paid special tribute to a man named Nimboy Jack from the Clarence River district in uh, northern New South Wales. Sid and his brother Frank sometimes use Aboriginal climbing techniques such as cutting notched toe holds with a tomahawk and descending the tree using a um, looped vine. They also used other devices, climbing spurs, ropes and poles, and in um, 1895 Sid devised a special rope ladder to facilitate his collecting enterprises. His and Frank's exploits with the ladder are jaw-dropping. In the picture here, down the bottom here, that's Sid Jackson. This guy is there. That's his brother Frank at the um, um, nest of a whistling kite. Whistling eagle, it was called then. Sid Jackson's diaries make fascinating reading. They record in meticulous detail not just what he did, but also his subjective state while doing it. They document his thoughts, emotions, and observations, and communicate his personality, attitudes, hopes, and fears. Jackson talked to his diaries, and by doing so made them far more than mere matter-of-fact narratives. His diaries bring back to life the day-to-day -day experiences of a birder of a bygone age. By the 1920s, birding was changing and the collecting of skins and eggs by amateur birders was becoming increasingly controversial. Indeed, in the interwar years, 
Disagreements over the ethics of amateur collecting were among the fiercest disputes among birders. Those disputes weren't confined to Australia. They were conducted with equal ferocity in America, in Britain, suggesting that some bigger transformation of attitudes toward the killing of living things was underway. Improvements in field, uh, field glasses, binoculars, and, and the advent of field guides uh, helped drive a shift towards observing rather than collecting. Australia acquired its first um, field guide in 1911 with the publication of J.A. Leach's An Australian Bird Book, from which the illustration there is taken. Also, also impelling that same change was the camera. Many of the new generation of bird photographers did not combine photography with collecting as their predecessors had done, but explicitly repudiated the latter in favour of the former. They urged that the bad old days of shooting birds with a gun must give way to a new era in which shooting would be only with a camera. I'll exemplify with the words of two of Australia's best bird photographers of the 1920s and 30s, R.T. Littlejohns and S.A. Lawrence, who in their wonderfully titled book of 1920, Birds of Our Bush or Photography for Nature Lovers wrote, and I'll read it out. Our chief argument in favour of photography as a means of observation is that the photographer in Gainey's ends need leave no trail of destruction in his wake. The collector, whether he shoots the birds or takes their eggs, has only desolation in one form or another upon which to pride himself should he contemplate the result of his day's work. The photographer, on the other hand, leaves or should leave his subjects just as he found them and no worse for his interference. He may go back again if he wishes to observe the progress of his friends or to picture some new phase of their lives. Their book, replete with such pleas is testament to how novel such an approach then was, although it's now taken for granted. But bird photography, 1920s and 30s, and later for that matter, was not for the faint-hearted. Lacking telephoto lens, these photographers engaged in heroic tree climbing, just as their egg-collecting forebears and um, contemporaries did. Or if the trees were not suitable to climb, they erected makeshift structures to get them up close to the nest because, because of the technological limits of the day, birds were virtually always photographed at or near nest. It's the only place where they sat still enough. The photo depicts Alec Chisholm and a friend trying to photograph a crested shrike tit nest at its nest, unsuccessfully as it turned out. The illustration provided the frontispiece for Chisholm's first and probably still his best known book, Mateship with Birds, published in 1922. The title, Mateship with Birds, flaunts Chisholm's message that the Australian people should bond emotionally with the birds around them for their own sake as well as that of the birds. Inside the book's cover, covers, that message was persistently reaffirmed. In lavish prose, profuse with imagery and studded with stanzas of quoted verse, he urged his readers to open their hearts to their avian compatriots and embrace them as friends and fellow Australians. In this, as in his, other, as in his prolific other writings, Chisholm sought to nurture in the public an emotional intimacy with Australian birds. Through such intimacy, he hoped, people would come to value not just the birds, but also the plants, animals and landscapes of this country, seek to conserve them and make them intrinsic to their national identity. The same theme suffuses Chisholm's 1932 book, Nature Fantasy in Australia, which was devoted to birds and bird watching in Sydney and surrounds. Setting the tone, its frontispiece is a painting by Neville Cayley, captioned The Spirit of Sydney, Scarlet Honey Eater at Nest 
in a suburban garden. And um, because I'm still waiting for the copy of that frontispiece, I had to substitute my own photo of a scarlet honey eater, but that has to do. The fact that this gorgeous little bird was common in Sydney's gardens exemplifies Chisholm's theme of urban Australians ready access to the wonders of nature. Some years later, we published news from nature celebrating the same accessibility for the residents of Melbourne. Chisholm explained to the readers of Sydney's Telegraph in 1932 that they did not have to, in his words, crawl into all manner of queer corners in order to see birds at their best. The joys of birding were easily accessible to all, he enthused, and could rejuvenate the souls of city people. In his characteristically lavish style, Chisholm lauded birdings as a mean to, his words, open the spiritual eye that develops when you come to regard the flash of a wing or the snuggling of a small mother on a nest as one of the most gracious things outside utopia. That's emblematic of the emotive strands that thread so prominently through the writings of Chisholm and fellow birders, past and present. But for the moment, I want to stick with the point that lots of birding is and always has been done in and near urban areas. It's a fact, I suspect, that you residents of Canberra must be continually, continually reminded of with the amazing diversity of bird life in your suburbs. In fact, I think Canberra must be the most birdy city I've ever been to. For the past two decades, the national birding organisation, BirdLife Australia, has run a program called Birds in Backyards, conducted an annual Aussie backyard bird count, which draws tens of thousands of eager participants. According to BirdLife, it's one of Australia's biggest citizen science events. Its name is new, as is the electronic wizardry that gets data from suburban gardens into scientific data sets. But birding in backyards, like citizen science itself, is far from novel. A hundred years ago, Harry Wollstone son of the suffragette Maybank Anderson, was a keen bird watcher who did most of his birding in his own garden in the northern, northern Sydney sub, suburb of Warunga. Sometimes he backyard birded alone, sometimes in company with notable birders of the day like Keith Hindwood, Alec Chisholm and Norman Chaffer. All of them not only admired Warunga's bird life, they meticulously recorded it and published their suburban ornithological studies in the EMU. A glance at the contents page of that journal in the early decades of the 20th century will reveal numerous studies of urban birds, citizen science of an earlier age. The huge volume of material on urban birds and birding illuminates some important aspects of bird watching history. I'm particularly interested in how it shows that although bird watching is by definition a nature-based recreation, the nature it cherishes encompasses the homely, everyday nature where we live, as well as the more remote places we like to imagine as approximating a state of nature. Of course, birders like to seek special species in Cape York and Costa Rica and other sites of excitement. In times gone by when long distance travel was more difficult and exotic places less accessible, well, that's a scenario that COVID seems to have gone some way to restoring. But then keen bird watchers did travel to see birds, but then as now, most birding was done close to home. That may be often for practical reasons. Most of us can't afford to spend too long too far from home. But it also underlines the fact that birds can be found and admired almost anywhere. Birding, as I've said, is a means for modern people to connect with nature. And the nature it connects us with encompasses the everyday nature near home, as well as those environments 
we consider more pristinely natural. Bird is treasure wild birds, but that just means birds that aren't caged or domesticated. Wild birds are ubiquitous or very nearly so. Bird watching puts people in touch with the wild near home. That's a wonderfully resonant phrase, I think, the wild near home. I've borrowed it from the American environmental historian Thomas Dunlap, who wrote a book on the history of bird watching in America based on his studies of the numerous field guides that were published there from 1880s onwards. It wouldn't be possible to write a history of bird watching in Australia, at least not a book length um, study, on that basis because Australia had too few field guides be before the 1970s. So I've had to cut, cast my research net a lot wider, which isn't a bad thing. I've circled back to field guides where I began with Cayley's What Bird Is That? And I want to reiterate the point that Cayley's field guide and its successes, including the many that today you can conveniently consult on your mobile phone. I was giving Luke a little demonstration of that just before we um, started. But field guides are not mere instruments allowing a name to be pinned to a bird. They're entry points into a world that touches ours, enriches it, and yet remains apart from it. Naming the bird is just a first step toward appreciation. Let me conclude with some reflection, reflections on one of the new generation of field guides, Graham Pizzi's Field Guide to the Birds of Australia, um, first published 1980. Strongly influenced by the great American field guide innovator, Roger Tory Peterson, there, this is Pizzi, oh, Pizzi is here, Roger Tory Peterson, uh, and his wife, Barbara, and an Argentinian um, um, birder on the other side. Anyway, um, Pizzi's work was strongly influenced by Roger Toy Peterson, and I'd have to say Pizzi's field guide is my personal favourite. Befitting the modern field guide, its introduction carries no patch of purple prose, as Cayley's did. Pizzi gets straight to the business of identifying birds. But we know that he wrote the book for more than purely instrumental purposes, for more than merely helping people name a bird. We know this because he was such a prolific writer, publishing innumerable books, magazine and newspaper articles in which he expounded his love of birds and his understanding of bird watching as a means of connecting people with nature. I know it also, because during my fellowship, I read in the papers of Francis Ratcliffe, held here in the National Library, I read correspondence between Pizzi and Ratcliffe. Ratcliffe was a CSIRO scientist and one of the founders of the Australian Conservation Foundations, Foundation. Discussing the field guide in the late 1960s, the field guide to be, because was, this is when Pizzi first started um, putting it together, um, both Pizzi and Ratcliffe continually referred to its value as a means of promoting public appreciation of birds and hence their conservation. In 1995, Greg Borschman interviewed Graham Pizzi for a National Library oral history project. Graham's daughter, Sarah Pizzi, kindly provided me with a transcript of that interview. At the end of a long discussion of his field guide, Graham observed that compiling it reinforced his conviction, I'm quoting him now, that the natural world is the absolute fundamental base. It's all our past, it's all our future. The natural world is the great truth, the one thing that we need to know about. I personally believe that it can answer most of our spiritual cravings are more and more confirmed in this general view of the primacy of the natural world and its importance to us spiritually as well as physically. 
to which the, uh, the interviewer, Borschmann, responded, in that sense then, this book, this field guide was your hymn. It was your testament. Yes, said Pizzi. Thank you. Thanks, Russell. Uh, we now have time for uh, some questions. Uh, as we're recording this presentation uh, at the moment, uh, if you do have a question, can you please wait for uh, the microphone to be brought down just so that we can record it for the online audience to be able to hear it as well. Uh, but uh, I'd now like to open up to the floor for any questions. Anyone? There must be oh, some look, questions. Time Here we questions. go. Hello. Uh, uh, Bill Coot is my name. Um, I, I'm not here to ask a question, but to um, make a confession, a public confession. Um, it, for Christmas 1960, I was given a copy of the 1959 edition of Cayley's book. Um, in the following year, I wrote a school essay on bird watching. And this is in a rural school in Queensland. Um, I think the, the, then the state health, uh, state education department inspector came around, and the nuns must have had to prepare a portfolio of students' work because the inspector came up to our classroom and wanted to meet the boy who'd written this lovely introductory paragraph. Um, and it's only today that I'm admitting it was the, <laughs> the first paragraph of Kaylee's introduction. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful memory. <laughs> Hi, look, thanks for that. That was really so fascinating. I just got one question. That's um, I wondered. It seems like a very male history mm. so far, um, and I know you've only just covered some some short, um, small amount of the material that you've covered. But is there any, are there any sort of gendered aspects to um, bird birding that you will cover in the book? Yes, certainly. Certainly, the, the gender aspect is certainly uh, will will certainly be covered. Um, in what I just said, I is just is just one the, the one throwaway line about um, you know collecting being a um, robust uh, masculine adventure. Um, but um, as I as I write more. Uh, there'll be more delving into the gender dimensions. Basically, in the up until the Second World War, it was certainly a very male-dominated activity in Australia. Interesting, that wasn't always the case overseas. In the United States, for example, birding at first was a predominantly female thing. That, that then then men came into it, and strangely enough, came to dominate it. Um, but in Australia, it was from the outset very male. There were a few women, like there was uh, um, uh, Ada Fletcher in Tasmania and some others. But after the Second World War, I think we begin to get more of a change. And today, I I think that um, if you know membership of bird life and so forth is taken as a uh, as an indicator women slightly outnumber men in um, birding circles. But still, at the sort of extreme end, twitching that is, males still well and truly predominate. Yeah. But uh, among recreational birders, there has been, since the Second World War, a drift toward greater gender balance and um, even perhaps slight predominance of, of, of women. Thanks for the talk, Russell. Um, I was um, tidying up, I suppose that's the word we use as we get older, um, all the junk that I'd accumulated over many, many years. And out of, um, out of one little box that had been tucked away for years and years came a, a little um, badge. 
that I'd acquired when I was in primary school. It was my membership of the Gould League of Bird Lovers. And I, really, I have vague recollections of kind of how we got it at school. I think there was an interested teacher who kind of mass enrolled classes of kids in the Gould mm. League. I'm not sure that anything came of it very much further. Um, and I kind of continued to hear about it for years and then it seemed to drop away entirely. But it was, a, it, uh, in those days, I guess, a fairly good um, kind of recruiting, recruiting field for young people, boys and girls, to become interested in what was going on or flying, or flying around, <coughs> pardon me, flying around them. And I just sort of wonder what has happened to it, um, whether it kind of features in your work at all and what its history is. Yep. Okay, Gould League of Bird Lovers certainly features in what I'm um, writing and researching. There's quite a lot of Gould League material here in the National Library. Um, founded in 1909, uh, one of the founders was J.A. Leach, the same guy as wrote the first field guide, which I gave some illustrations from. He wasn't the only, he was among the founders. There was, there was a number of, it was founded in Victoria. Did you go to school in Victoria, by any chance? New South Wales, okay. The, the, the heartland of the Gould League of Bird Lovers was always Victoria. It lasted longest there. It still survives today. It's no longer, no longer called the Gould League of Bird Lovers. As far as I know, I could be mistaken, it's called the Gould League. They cut the bird lovers bit out. I think in uh, the late 60s, early 70s, as it took a broader conservationist stance. You know, it, it, it was... It was initially, it was very much a conservationist oriented um, body. The idea was to encourage kids to appreciate birds and thereby conserve them. That's, it's, that's the basic motivation behind it all. In the 60s, I think late 60s, early 70s, uh, it became a broader based conservationist um, um, organisation for children and it dropped off bird lovers off the end. I, but I think, you know, of bird lovers has a wonderful sort of charm to it myself. Uh, actually, in the, in the first version of this talk that I put together, there was a section on the Gould League of Bird Lovers, um, but then other things came along, it got dropped, I'm afraid. But yeah, the, the body still exists, and um, uh, I think it was quite influential uh, at one time, particularly in Victoria, where... Where, 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 it, uh, where it was strongest. It, uh, eventually it got to, I'm not sure about all states, most, it was active for a short while in Queensland, not for longer in um, New South Wales. Um, Western Australia, it came late to Western Australia, but it did get there. Uh, South Australia, I'm not sure, Tasmania, I'm not sure. Just on that, colleagues might correct me, but our 2019 fellow, Andrea Gaynor, who was looking at childhood and, mm. and the outdoor, I, my recollection is that she did a lot on the Gould League, mm. so it's quite likely we've, we've got a recording of her talk yeah. um, on our website. So, so within yeah. a fairly short period, we've had, had quite deep research into uh, yeah, children and bird watching and nature. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, the, the project I'm doing, I will, be look, I will be looking at children's involvement in bird watching, but that's not my focus. I'm really looking more at adults, but necessarily I look at children also, and that's where the, the Gould League has a very big prominent place. And also, of course, you know, many, many birders began as Gould Leaguers. Um, what is the most exciting bird that you've seen in your bird watching that's given you real buzz? All of them. <laughs> Any really rare ones that you're um, very The most exciting, of? the most, yeah, I'm not sure what the most exciting. Um, hmm, 
No, I'm, I'm really not sure what the most exciting, I suppose in some ways, but this sort of um, um, goes back to what, I was having a chat with Luke before, uh, and he asked me what my favourite bird was. And again, there's many favourites, but I did um, nominate one, the white-throated jerigony, largely because of its amazing song. But Luke told me that his son, I think it's your son, yeah, his favourite bird was, is the cassowary. So if you're asking for one of the most exciting birds I've seen, I guess cassowary would be among them, partly because you know, when you're close up to a cassowary, you realise these are fearsome animals. You know? and so it's, it's exciting, not just that you're seeing a bird that's not very common, but you know, it's a bird that can do you real damage. So in that sense, maybe a cassowary is the most exciting. Any other questions? Unfortunately, I didn't bring this book with me, but just recently someone provided me, and I don't know who it was, with a wonderful book called The Law of the Ly Lyrebird. And it was um, republished many, many times after its original appearance, I think in the 1950s. No, before. Ambrose Pratt. Ambrose 19... Pratt is the author. 1930s, then. 30s, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and I've watched and listened to Lyrebird's a great deal, but it was, wasn't until this last summer that I actually heard their, their own call. Uh -huh. I've heard all the mm. imitations of other birds, mm. but so I was uh, in the rainforest down the coast here, and I heard this incredible boing yep. noise. Yep. Yep. I can't give, give it proper. <laughs> Not being a liar bird. Yep. No. But uh, it was quite astonishing to me, and there mm. happened to be one other bird watcher, and I said, what the hell's that noise out there? He said, mm. it's a lyre bird. Mm. <laughs> so uh, it's, was, it's quite unusual because I've had a, been a bird watcher since the 60s, so I've never heard its no? own call until Okay. Year. Okay. You've been a bird watcher, you say, since the 1960s? Oh, okay. So, um, but yeah, lyre birds, it's hard, sometimes with the mimics, it's hard to know, you know, what, what's its natural call and what's its, what's the mimicked calls. Um, but they're certainly masters of mimicry. Hello, is that on? Yes. Interesting to see one of your quotes you put up there talked about an alternate name and seeing the liar bird has come up. Mm. One of those quotes talked about liar tail. Mm. I've never seen the word liar tail oh. ever used, but really it's a better name. Liar bird is a bit uninteresting and vague, <laughs> but liar tail is more descriptive and mm. interesting. And a little comment on that, of course, lyre birds mimic as well as give a lot of their own calls and they intersperse them when, mm. when they're doing... Their important stuff is their own sounds. All the mimicry is fill-in. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, Philip. Yeah, the lyre tail was, lyre tail was, a, was a, a name in, uh, in fairly common use early in the 20th century, possibly before too. I mean, it, it's had... Um, it's gone through... For, Various, um, uh, I mean, lyre bird was used as, at the same time because we're talking about a time before uh, there was even less standardisation of bird names as um, what there is today. And I guess lyre tail is a more descriptive, um, is a more descriptive, um, but don't suggest it to the um, committee that, um, that Jeffrey sits on <laughs> so we can have another name change. Um, I'm quite happy with superb lyrebird, Albert's lyrebird. And um, the, for the non-birders among you, uh, vernacular names of birds are things that, if, if names are things, um, are issues over which some, some birders get quite heated 
about uh, the um, vernacular names of birds. Uh, what should what should we call them and why? And they're also they under the the um, official or recognised vernaculars undergo a constant process of change, um, just like scientific names do too, for that matter. Um, but yeah, it is a, it is an issue of um, some heated debate among certain segments of the birding community. Another suggestion, though, that the lyrebird, lyrebird's call, own call, replicates the twanging of a lyre, the musical instrument. Um, the, but the, the name certainly comes from its tail shape. I think we're, it's quite clear that the, 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 the name, well, the name comes from the lyrebird's tail being arranged in a position that it would never naturally hold its tail in, but arranged in that manner, it resembles a um, ancient Greek lyre. That's, that's why it was named that. Um, but it had other, I mean, in the early days, it had all the other names as well, native pheasant and all sorts of things. It was it had a whole heap of names. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for this afternoon. Um, but thank you for taking us on a ramble, in your words, um, through your uh, through your studies and through uh, the work that you've done here at the library. Um, but also for putting us in touch uh, with the wild at home. And I know it's uh, one of the things that, uh, as a youngster, my parents uh, gave me some books. I didn't um, plagiarise any for school assignments, but I'm glad we could act as that sort of <laughs> confessional for you uh, today, Bill. But um, being able to, um, to span across generations, I think, is the other really neat thing um, that it teaches us. Um, a couple of plugs before we leave for, uh, for the keen researchers amongst our audience. I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that our fellowships and scholars program uh, for 2023 is open now. Uh, if you're an experienced researcher, a PhD student, creative writer, artist or folk uh, practitioner and you wish to use our collections uh, to advance your projects, as you've seen our collections are pretty uh, wide ranging and, and amazing, um, there may be a, a fellowship or a scholarship that's uh, suitable for you. So you can check those details uh, on our website, on the National Library of Australia website. Uh, and for those of you who are feeling inspired again by the love of birds, um, a little plug for our bookshop, make sure you stop past the bookshop, um, particularly to uh, pick up a copy of uh, the 60th anniversary uh, edition of Judith Wright's poems in birds. Uh, there's a little display in the shop there. Um, not only are these uh, poems uh, brilliant pieces of work uh, that span back, but also the illustrations come from uh, the, some of the National Library's collections as well, and is part of our publishing program. Uh, on that note, we'll wrap up for today, but please join me again in thanking uh, Russell McGregor for today's fascinating presentation. Thank you.